Welcome to The Real News Network. I'm Jessica Devereaux in Baltimore. And welcome to our second part of our conversation about Gaza and Israel. And we are now joined by Richard Folk. Richard Folk joins us by telephone from Turkey. Richard is a professor emeritus of international law at Princeton University. In 2008, the United Nations Human Rights Council appointed Richard to a six-year term as a UN Special Rapporteur on Palestinian human rights. Thanks for joining us again, Richard. Uh, glad to be with you again, Jessica. So, Richard, let's turn to the issue of the role of the United Nations in all of this. You recently signed an open letter that criticized the UN, specifically Secretary General Ban Ki-moon, for his various statements and actions regarding Israel's assault. What did he say that made you think that it warranted criticism? Well, I think the Secretary General should be associated with the implementation of the UN Charter, international law, and the maintenance of peace and security, rather than siding with Israel that, in my view, uh, was violating the UN Charter's most uh, fundamental imperative, which is expressed as saving succeeding generations from the scourge of war. This was not a case of legitimate self-defense. Uh, Israel provoked the rocket attacks which caused minimal uh, damage and launched this massive uh, attack, then shifted the rationale to uh, the from rockets to the tunnels, and it was clear that, that destruction of residential areas was not connected with uh, dealing with the tunnels, which had uh, not been responsible for a single Israeli casualty, and which Egypt had closed without ever crossing uh, the border to Gaza. And there were as many as 700 tunnels in the southern part of Gaza uh, facing the Egyptian uh, border. So there was no military necessity, even if one accepts the rationale for the war. So the UN Secretary General really uh, showed his alignment with the forces of geopolitics rather than as he should align himself with international law and international morality. But Richard, Ban Ki-moon has also made statements, um, I want to point to this one in particular, um, where he said, quote, the people of Gaza have nowhere to run. They are trapped, besieged on a speck of land. Every area is a civilian area. Every home, every school, every refuge has become a target. The casualties and damage raises serious concerns about proportionality. Doesn't this actually change the narrative and challenge the Israeli narrative about this assault and, and that Israel does not deliberately target civilians or civilian infrastructures? Isn't that some way stepping out of that framework? You're quite right, Jessica, to raise that uh, issue. He uh, changed the tone after the uh, Israeli military operation assumed such a massive character. There's a distinction made in, in law and in the whole idea of just war between recourse to war and the conduct of war. And what he endorsed was the recourse to war and what he backed away from, particularly after uh, UN facilities were being targeted, even though they were offering uh, some kind of shelter to uh, Palestinians that had no place to go, as he points out in the statement you read. And in that sense, uh, he did assume a more appropriate role, but uh, I think it was important to suggest that the UN Secretary General should stand for the uh, implementation of the UN Charter, especially with respect to recourse to war. It also has emerged from WikiLeaks that he, while Secretary General, tried to interfere with the implementation of the Goldstone Report that had uh, detailed Israel's crimes during the 
prior 2008-2009 Operation Cast Lead. And that again suggested a partisanship at the level of the UN Secretary General uh, that's not exactly surprising, but it is something that people who care about uh, law and morality should be vigilant in opposing, in my view. Richard, what are the limits of the United Nations in regards to resolving parties like Hamas and Israel, uh, being, being able to hold them accountable for crimes against humanity that the UN has previously accused them of? I think the important thing, Jessica, in understanding what the UN can and can't do is to recognize that it is above all a political institution that is subject to the constraints imposed by geopolitics. So if the political forces want the UN to be effective, as they did, for instance, in relation to Libya in 2011, then the UN can be very effective, maybe too effective, in uh, carrying out some kind of global policy. But if the geopolitics are divided or if they are aligned uh, with, as in this case, uh, Israel, then the UN can only act symbolically. It can uh, organize, as it did with the Goldstone Report, an investigation and a uh, fact-finding uh, report, and it's undertaken that now in relation to Protective Edge. It's appointed a commission, and that commission will uh, report on allegations of war crimes. But it won't be able to implement that report, whatever it should end up recommending, because that's where the geopolitical veto blocks UN action. So the UN is no better and no worse than what its most powerful members wanted to do or not do. Let's name those powerful members just so our viewers get a sense of who, who exactly we're talking about here. Well, in a constitutional sense, we're talking about the five permanent members of the UN Security Council, which, in, uh, which are U.S., China, United Kingdom, uh, France, and Russia, of course. I should, I should not forget that. Uh, th but in practical political terms, it is really the U.S. most of the time alone having a, this geopolitical veto. The, the U.S.'s role uh, is uh, defined by two kinds of overlapping uh, power. The one is the constitutional power of the veto, which it enjoys together with the other four permanent members of the UN Security Council, and it enables it and the others to block any decision of the Security Council uh, that is adverse to their uh, fundamental interests. In addition, the U.S. has what I'm calling a geopolitical veto, which uh, derives from its uh, actual power within the organization that can be used to either uh, block initiatives, as it has done when there's been a move to uh, censure Israel for some of its policies, or it can empower the institution as it did in relation to Lib the Libyan intervention of 2011. So there are those two features that make it, uh, that underscore this uh, central point that I've been trying to make, which is the UN is no better and no worse than what its most powerful members want it to be. Richard, you earlier mentioned the United Human Rights Council, um, how they are creating a commission and an, an independent inquiry, really, into the war crimes committed during Operation Protective Edge. So for you, what, what do you think they will find, and, and what impact will it have then? 
Well, I think it's a commission of qualified, uh, objective observers who have expert credentials. What it will find is not likely to be anything surprising for those that have followed the events of the last few weeks carefully because they've been rather fully uh, uh, described in, in the media. They will interpret those events from the perspective of international humanitarian law and the law of war, and they will come to the expected results uh, that Israel used disproportionate force, that it attacked civilian uh, structures that were well marked, that it didn't give adequate warning, it didn't allow civilians to find places of sanctuary, and that it uh, engaged in a series of uh, practices that are inconsistent with its obligation to protect the civilian society of uh, Gaza. And it may additionally find that the overall character of the attack constituted a flagrant uh, violation of the prohibition on collective punishment, which is contained in Article 33 of the Fourth Geneva Convention. And, and the impact, did you, can you elaborate on that? Impact, uh, well, the impact will be subject, I believe, to this uh, secondary uh, process that UN has the uh, capacity through a kind of majoritarian uh, consensus uh, to initiate an investigation of this sort, even though uh, it was deeply by Israel and the United States, but it can't implement the report that is likely to emerge, which will be critical of the policies pursued by Israel. And presumably the opposition to forming this commission was based on the anticipation of a negative set of findings. Israel and the U.S. claim it's because the Human Rights Council is biased I would say it's because the character of the events are such that it's almost inescapable for anyone with a 10% open mind to avoid coming to the conclusion that Israel committed war crimes in the course of carrying out this military operation. All right, Richard Falk joining us via phone from Turkey. Thank you so much for being with us. Good to be with you, Jessica. Take care. And thank you for joining us on The Real News Network.